Um, so I have something to confess, first of all. Uh, this evening I have done something that I normally never do. Never, ever, 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 ever do. And it is that I have scrapped the message that I was to preach this evening um, because my heart has been so burdened that uh, I just want to share uh, the messages of my heart. That sounds awfully charismatic and it's terrible that we have to apologize for that. But I kind of realized this afternoon while I was listening to Daniel preach and I thought that was a great sermon that Daniel gave us and a great presentation of the doctrine of sola fide. And then when I considered my own message and I thought to myself, you know, I want to say something personal. But being how I am very kind of anal, I thought, but I have a message prepared. That's what I have to do. But yet today, as again, I, I went out with Roger this, this afternoon and always in the back of my mind, there was this, as a pastor, I want to speak to you tonight. I want to speak not to the person to the right of you or to the person to the left of you. I want to speak to you tonight. You and I may not have spent time together here at the conference. I may not have had the opportunity to sit down with you and talk with you, to hear your stories, to tell you my stories. But this evening, I want to speak to you. I want to exhort you tonight. I want to encourage you tonight. So that when you leave this place and you go back to where, wherever you have come from, each to our own place, you won't just think to yourself, well, we went to this place, this crazy part of Swedish-speaking Finland that we didn't even know existed. And then we heard some preaching. We had some great food. We had some good fellowship. And then we all went back home to our places and we got on with our normal life. Beloved, I want you to go home changed. I want you to go home bolder and braver with a, a greater love for the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not my intent to entertain you. It is my intent, my desire, my ambition that you might be changed, that you might be transformed, that you might be renewed, that when you go home, you have a greater courage, a complete trust, in the Lord Jesus Christ. That you no longer look just simply at yourself and your weakness and stumble and trip over your own feelings, but you will be bold and brave and that you will look unto Jesus. And because of His finished work, because of the sacrifice that He has made for you, you will Know the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. That when the problems and difficulties of this life, and beloved, problems and difficulties of this life are in abundance at this time, when they come, and when they threaten to toss you this side or that side, when they seek to take over your mind and dominate your heart, you will be able to look at them and say, my, my God reigns. I will not fear. And I will not surrender. And yet you will be strengthened in your faith. Tonight, I had prepared a message on Romans 4, going from verse through verse through verse. But tonight, I only want to look at three of those verses. Romans 4, verses 19 to 21. Let me please read them to you. And not being weak in faith, he, that is Abraham, did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise 
of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Beloved, tonight I want to encourage you who believe, you who have faith, to believe all the more. And you might say to me, well, you don't know me. But we're having a conversation now. We're talking now. The Bible says if you have this faith the size of a mustard seed, a mustard seed is the, the size of a grain of salt. That's a very little thing. The Bible says if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can change the world. How much faith do you have, beloved? Not in yourself, but in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, ha we, we have heard wonderful preaching, and it has been wonderful, not just because it's my conference or our conference, but the Lord has really blessed us with good, solid preaching this, this conference. We are very fortunate to have such gifted young men. And Paul Washer, old man. But beloved, we must always remember that our faith is not in ourselves, in our actions or our confidence. Faith is not the feeling in which we live. It is the assurance that Jesus has done it all. I hope you can read the words above my head. It says, it is finished. Completed. Accomplished. Ended. Jesus has done it all. And this evening, I want to encourage you in your faith. I want you to go home and live differently. To be bold and almost reckless. Oh. To be fearless. Not because... We pump you up. Not because I say, yeah, high five. Let's go for it, kids. Because you're all kids. But because you have glimpsed Jesus Christ. You have seen Him crucified. And you have believed upon Him. And you have received the Spirit of God. Does not this, the Bible, does not the Scripture say that He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Why should we fear? Why should we hesitate? Why should we hold back in our love and service for him? Again, I, I haven't spoken to all of you, spoken to some of you. And I know here we have young men interested in evangelism, in street preaching. I know that we have guys planting the church, constructing it, changing it, forming it, refining it. We have mothers of multiple children. We have young men who are called to the ministry. We have the guys in the back doing all of the, the media stuff. I would have you be bolder a more assured and strengthened in your life. Not just your faith. When we talk about faith, I am not talking about a feeling. I'm not talking about you feeling good all the time. It's not about you. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, I would have you strengthened in your faith. The Bible says of Abraham that he is the father of the faithful. That he is our father by faith. He's the man of faith. And as his spiritual children, we should be fully aware of his character, 
of who he was, we should seek to emulate him. I don't know. I mean, some, we have so many kids here at this camp conference. And, and sometimes I look and I think, whose child is that? And then I'll see the child do something and I'll go, ah, and whose child that is? You know? The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, brother. You know, or you can hear them before you see them. Isn't that right, Don? You know whose kids are whose. Because of family traits, because of similarities, because of learnt behavior, nurture over nature. And Abraham is the father of our faith, and there should be a likeness between us and him. His faith should be a representation of our own. We should seek to emulate. You know, you're seeing little boys who want to be like their dad. It doesn't happen so much in my family. Small, fat, and bald. Doesn't really go. But we should seek to emulate, to copy. And the Scriptures talk about him here. Verse 20, he did not wither at the promise of God through unbelief. Think about that. He's a man who's almost a hundred, married to a very elderly lady. And the promise of God is that he will have a son in his old age. Yet the Bible says he did not even waver. He didn't doubt once. Not once. His faith wasn't in his ability because he had no ability. He was an old man. There was nothing in him or his wife. And yet the Bible says he did not waver. Not because he was looking at himself, but because his eyes were upon God. He knew the character of his God. He knew the nature. He knew the power of God. And therefore was not afraid. He was fully convinced that God could do what God had promised to do. The key to his success was that he did not consider himself. He did not look at the natural. How often have we hesitated? How often have we been hindered in our walk, in our life together with Christ, in this normal and natural world, when we look at the natural? You young men, with your desire to do evangelism. And you're going out there and, and evangelism's hard. You think to yourself, people won't listen. The Finns don't care. Hearts are hard. But this is the glory. We do not trust in their hearts or our abilities. We trust in the saving power of God. It is by grace alone, by the kindness of God alone, and it is He who gives faith and awakens sinners. The Bible says that God saves the ungodly. We do not do evangelism. We do not go into the streets. We do not speak to our neighbor, our family member, our, 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 our friend at work because they're more likely, they're religiously minded, they might or they might not. It does not matter if they're the greatest atheist in the world. Portray before their eyes Christ who is crucified. Call them to faith and repentance. And have confidence in God that He is able to save. I was driving with Roger today as we were going through the countryside. And I shared with him, I said, you know, as we're going in the, through the rural areas and you're driving forest, 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 occasional field, forest, 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 house. Forest, 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 forest. And I, and I said, you know, I have often wondered and prayed and asked the Lord, how, Lord, will we reach these people? How, Lord, will we get the message to these people? 
that without Christ they are lost. If they do not believe, they are lost. And they are destined for hell. How do we, how do we, Lord, how do we get the message to them? And I shared with Roger that for years that used to haunt me. How do we get to every house? And then I read a story about the Great Awakening in America. That it was much more rural than you and I have. Much less people than, than in our day. And yet, the supernatural power of God moved through the nation. People were just awakened. People were moved and stirred in their hearts. And they had to seek a preacher. Imagine, and the stories are true, they, whole villages of people would gather and say, I don't know why, but I think we should all go over to the other village. There are stories of, of whole villages traveling three days to get to a certain town, not understanding why, but they had a passion and a burning. They knew that they had to get there for some reason. And as they got to the town and as they all kind of lumbered in, within the hour, the evangelist, Whitfield, would preach. They, they did not know that he was coming. They had no internet. They had no phones. They had no television. There was no leaflet drops. No writing in the sky. But the sovereign work of God in the hearts of men, drawing and pulling the sinner much more effective, much more efficient. We know the result. There was a great awakening, a great revival that spread through the entire region of rural America. And the influences of that revival are still seen in American culture today. At least the ends of it. Beloved, do not worry do not fear. Do not waver in unbelief. But stand firm and strong in knowing that our God is able. And not only is He able, He is willing. For our God delights in salvation. Oh, beloved, if we would only trust Him, if we would only walk in His ways and keep His requirements, what blessings we would see. What answers to prayer. What fulfillments of promises we would see in our day. Beloved, you know that I am a history buff. Okay, I'm a history nerd. I will bore you with history stories all night long. But it is not enough for me to read the stories of time gone by. I have read the stories of the Great Awakening and I have read the stories of revivals in Europe and the Reformation. It is not enough for me to have read it. I desire to see it in our day. Oh God, move in the hearts of people that they might see and know and understand and believe. Beloved, I would encourage you to faith. Not in your ability. Not in your courage. But in the power of our God. You know, it says in the book of Daniel that though those people who know they're gone, they will be bold. They will be brave, courageous, strong. And they will do great things. Beloved, so often our hearts are troubled because we no longer keep our eyes upon God. We are not comforted by the promises of God because we allow ourselves to be distracted. Who am I? What do I have? And we're so self-centered, so man-centered in our Christianity. If we would only lift up our eyes, Lift them up to the Lord Jesus Christ and hold on to that cross and say, Lord, by your finished work, what peace we would know. What glories we would see. And I'm not saying God's going to raise you up to be a revivalist. 
in your normal, everyday, mundane life. In the everyday and normal, having the peace of God guard your mind. Victory over sin. Deliverance from pride and from fear. Beloved, as we're having this talk this evening, you and I, I want you to be stronger in your faith. And that's the reason why we've been talking about sola fide. Not just to give you doctrinal, theological knowledge, but that your life might be different. Do not trust in the things that you see the things that you can hold on to, the things that you can point to and say, I have my confidence in my smartphone, in my credentials, in my authority. Look unto Jesus. You who are believers, look unto Jesus. Tonight you are here in It is the will of God that you are here. And it is the will of God that you and I have this conversation. Please don't think I am talking to the person next to you. Don't say in your heart, this is a good message for that person over there. I am talking to you. The heart of God desires that you know the fullness, that you trust, that you're able to walk with Him in peace. Not fluttering around, not blown like a leaf in the wind, not the victim of oppression. Oh, beloved, if we would only get a hold of this doctrine, if we would only get a hold of the crucified Christ, of that great declaration, it is finished, it is completed, it is successful, it has been delivered. We could turn the world upside down. Nothing would stop us. Beloved, if we truly acted like we believed, we believe that the world is lost and the people are going to hell. Our loved ones, our brothers, our sisters, our children, our mothers and our fathers. And if we truly believe that there was salvation only found in the Lord Jesus Christ, through faith in Him and Him alone, would we not speak more? Would we not act more urgently? Would there not be more of an energy to our faith? Beloved, I would have you believe more. Stronger in your faith. More resolute in your walk with God. Not fearful not backward. I, would, I, I desire young men, young women, people, old people, my kind of people, with a backbone of steel. That we will never bend and we will never give up. You can throw us to the lions. You can put us in jail. You can mock us. You can write things about us. You can call us names. You can put us in prison. We don't care. We win in the end. Oh, beloved, I would have you stronger in your faith tonight. Let us not waver in our faith. Let us not doubt. Jesus Christ died for your sins to give you new life. Do you believe it? Jesus Christ died that you might be born again. Are you born again? Do you know the peace of God that surpasses all understanding? Has God taken away that spirit of fear, giving you a spirit of power, love, and of sound mind? Can you say that, like that hymn that I, I, I said the other night, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to your cross I cling. That when we come before God, when we live our lives before God, before the face of God, 
we're not always trying to please them. Like some wee dog with its tail wagging. We're not like some child trying to get his attention all the time. Pulling at his shirt. As, daddy, daddy, daddy. Daddy, daddy, daddy. Look at me, look at me, look at me. But there is a maturity and a strength and a stability. The Bible says that God's people are quickly destroyed because they do not have knowledge. They don't know Him. Hosea 4 and 6, My people are swiftly destroyed because they lack knowledge. And the next verse says, He will reject them and their children because they do not know. Beloved, let us not be absent. Let us, not, let us not neglect the promises of God. Let us not neglect that great work of the, the cross. We can be so busy about church life, so busy with the kids, so busy with our career, so busy with stuff that we miss the simplicity of it all. Life passes us by and Christ is lost in the crowd. We have hours and that's all we need. But beloved, it should not be so. I, I do not want a weak, cowardly, finished church. I desire a reformed Christian church in Finland. We will only ever see that the promise, the promise of a movement, the promise of biblical churches. Oh, think about that. Think about if we were to come in 10 years and instead of only three churches, there's 15, 20. You're like, Kyle, you're talking madness. Challenge me. Challenge me. Dare me. My God is big. Beloved, let's believe great things. Did you not hear the message about William Carey? The little shoemaker? He wasn't even a shoemaker. He was a repairer of shoes. You know, beloved, I'm just a dishwasher. I just wash dishes. Peel, peel potatoes. If you ask me, Kyle, what are your, your special abilities? Peeling potatoes. That's what I'm good at. My son says, because I'm Irish. I say, no. It's just my gift. Beloved, let's dream big. Let's ask. Let's press on. Lord, you died on the cross. You've already paid the price. You've already purchased your church. You've purchased their salvation. Oh, Lord, send me. Give me opportunities. Open doors. Lord, as I speak, open their hearts, Lord. Think. Think of the promise. Do you have loved ones in your family who are not saved? I don't think there's one of us here tonight that has a complete family of believers. And you look at them and you think to yourself, I, I don't know if they'll ever believe. I just see nothing in them that's ever going to Hallelujah, amen. Oh, a challenge. We're not trying to convince them. We want the Holy Spirit to convict them of their sin. To gloriously and wonderfully save them and transform them and change them. To re that they might be reborn. A different person. Do you know the story of Lazarus from the Bible? Not Lazarus the beggar, but Lazarus the friend of Jesus who died. And he was in the grave. How many days, sorry? How many days was he in the grave? Four days. Remember Jesus said, open the, open the grave, roll back the stone. And they said, but Lord, he's been in the grave four days and he stinks. And he said, do it anyway. And they rolled back the door and Jesus said, Lazarus, come out and... Lazarus comes out wrapped in his rags and his, in his garments. Four days is a long time to be dead, especially in the Middle East. 
Now, if the Lord can do that, why can't He transform and change and save a sinner dead in their sins, dead in their trespasses and sins? Do we not believe in the God of resurrection? He gives resurrection life. Not just when we die, but here on earth. Beloved, I would have you strong in faith expectant in your faith. All too often we have become pessimistic. We look with the eyes in our head and we look around us and say, oh, it's so little. There's so few of us. What can I do? There's so, you know, Nobody else is doing the things that you're doing. Praise God, hallelujah, amen. Jesus changed the world with 12 apostles. If you read the history of those apostles, they went everywhere. Went to India. Went to Mongolia. Down into Africa. Took the gospel everywhere they could. Wherever their little feet took them. Why? Because they believed. And they knew the Christ who had been crucified. And that Jesus had purchased their salvation. Beloved, let us not waver in unbelief, but let us remain steadfast in the promise. The promise is that Christ will build His church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. People will get saved. People will get sanctified. They will be transformed and they will be changed. The, the numbers will be added to. Do you have a family member who doesn't believe that their hearts are hard against the Gospel? Or a family member who is... Make them an object of prayer. Make them an object of prayer. aggressively pray for them. He said, well, I have prayed. Nothing's happened. Don't stop praying. Do you not remember the lesson of the, the widow who, and the unrighteous judge? That he said, she came to him day and night, day and night, day and night, until she got what she wanted. And Jesus said, in, in like manner, you also. Do you believe? Do you believe that Christ is the only one who can save? If so, rejoice in that because salvation isn't natural. It's God-given. It is God who saves. Beloved, do not waver in unbelief, but be strengthened in your faith. Did God save you? Were you born again? Were you transformed and changed? Have you experienced the renewal of God's Spirit within you? Remember what it said in Genesis? Received His Spirit. How, or Genesis, Galatians, forgive me. If so, if God can save you, are you special? Are you cleverer than most? Are you better looking than most? Don't be foolish. It was an act of God's mercy and grace. And then what He has done for you, He will do for others. Be confident in that. Be confident in your faith of who He is and what He has done. Be confident. We are so weak because we do not know the Scriptures. Has there ever been a generation that does not know the Scriptures? We... We have access to the Bible in many different languages. I have on my phone at least 16 different versions of the Bible. I can have my phone speak the Bible to me. It reads it for me in any language that I want, even Greek. We have such unlimited access and yet... We're as dumb as mud. There is so much ignorance. Beloved, seek the Lord. Beloved, read the promises. In my house, 
have all these little booklets, not booklets, uh, hefte, notebooks, notebooks scattered all over the house. Some of them I've had since like 1993 or something. And they're just little notebooks. And then if you open them, you'll see Bible verses scribbled quickly. And they are memory books for me. So that whenever I want to learn a new Bible verse, or I, you know, I'm reading the Scriptures and something leaps off the page, or I, there's a, a, a portion of Scripture that I know is important, I'll write it down. And then I'll write it down again. And, you know, people must, if you were to go into my notebooks, scribbled, you'll see the same Bible verse scribbled maybe 16 times. I have a bit of a problem. Because I want to learn it. I want it not just to be in my head. I want it to be in my heart. I want to be able to live it, to believe it. Beloved, set your heart to learn the Word of God. You say, well, that's only for pastors and elders and Bible people. No, beloved, it is for you because it is currency. They are the promises of God to you. And if you don't know them, you don't know your rights. You don't know what's on offer. You don't know what He's promised. You don't know what He's asked. If you walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and take charge in my courts. If you walk in my ways and keep my requirements. Well, if you don't know His ways and you don't know His requirements, how are you going to walk in them? If my Word abides in you and you in it. But if you don't know His Word, how is it going to abide in you? Wishful thinking. You know, I saw this meme of a Chinese child and I really, it resonated really with me. He's sitting in a classroom and he has an open book and he's kind of taking the essence of the, the page and doing this and then turning the next page because he doesn't want to read it, so he wants the spirit of the book to kind of come into his mind, you know? At least that's what I think he's doing. And I was like, I really wish that worked, you know? We could just sit there and kind of take in the essence of the book. But we cannot, beloved. We are weak in faith because we are weak in the Word. Oh, that we would have a revival of Bible reading. A revival of Bible learning. You don't believe the Bible because you don't know the Bible. Your life is weak and powerless because you are not trusting Christ because you do not know the Scriptures. And partly that is because we, we have not had healthy churches and healthy elders to proclaim the Word, to steer us and to guide us. But look, we're having a conversation now as a pastor to the people of God. Let me encourage you. Let me instruct you. Let me give you a kick. Read the Scriptures. Read the Scriptures. Put them to memory. Make it your ambition to read through the Bible in a year. You know if you read 10 chapters a day, you can read the Bible three times in a year? What? Not only just read, as you read it, the Spirit of God in you will resonate. It's His Word. It's Him talking to you. And your faith will be strengthened. I remember I, there was a time a few months ago, maybe before the corona, I can't remember. And I was just tired. Lord, I'm tired. Tired of always having to... to tired, Lord. And it was time for my daily Bible reading. And I sat down with my Bible. And I was like, Lord, I'm tired, Lord. But it was routine. And so I opened the Bible. And I happened to be reading through the book of Psalms. And I got to Psalm 119. And I began to read through it. And as I got down to about, I don't know, the 20-something verse, 
My heart was a flame. And I got down on my knees and I said, Lord, forgive me for my, my coldness. Forgive me for my slowness. Oh, I'm so strengthened in my faith. And I got up and I read the rest of the psalm and then I reread it. And my soul was nourished and fed. And I could see Him in His glory and in His wonder. And I was strengthened in my faith. Beloved, I would have you strengthened in your faith. Not in a feeling. Not in some sort of, I feel confident. Your faith is your assurance, your confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. In His finished work. In that He has accomplished what He has sent out, what He set out to do. And that He is making it happen here on earth today, now. We do not believe in a defeated Jesus. We do not believe in an insufficient church. Christ is building His church in the gates of hell. Death itself, Hades, will not be able to stop it. Oh, beloved. As a pastor speaking to a church member, as one man speaking to another, one person to another. Again, I'm not talking to the person next to you, the person in front of you. Tonight, you and I are having a conversation. I desire you to be strengthened in your faith. And first and foremost, that's going to happen by you knowing the Word of God. You're not going to be full of doubt not going to be afraid, not going to be fearful that it's only going to be you and whoever for the next 10 years, 15 years. Christ promised that He would build His church. Do you believe it? Read the Word and be strengthened in your heart. Read the end of the book and know that we win. Know that there is a vast multitude in heaven beyond numbering gathered before the throne crying out, Holy, Holy, Holy. Heaven isn't just like three or four of us. It's a vast crowd without number. Who says that God cannot move in our nation and cause a new reformation, a new revival, a new great awakening. Let me tell you who says that that can't happen. People who do not know the Word. And people who waver in unbelief. People who do not know their God. For they are neither strong, neither do they do bold things. Beloved, I'm not here to browbeat you and, and point out how terrible you are. I am just like you. I am just like you. I am here this evening to lift your eyes off yourself and to set them upon Jesus Christ and Him crucified that He has purchased for Himself a bride. He has redeemed her. And He is in the process of sanctifying her, of transforming her, of changing her, of adorning her. Making her look beautiful. Beloved, trust Him. Be bold and careless again. Don't do stupid things. But be joyful. Rejoice in the fact that our God wins. Abraham, when faced of the reality of his problem. He was an old man who was nearly 100. Let me tell you, when you get a bit older, everything's a bit slower. Get a bit of a gut. You're not as young as you once were. And it's easy to kind of doubt. It's key. You look at yourself, well, Phew. if I had asked Abraham to run 100 meters, it probably would have killed him. But yet, God had promised Abraham a son and that He would be the Father of nations, and the blessing would flow from Him. And because God made the promise, because God made the promise, 
Abraham believed. If I had said to Abraham, Abraham, you're going to have a child. Don't worry about it. A hundred years old, Abraham. Just eat some ginger. You'll be all right. Abraham would have looked at him and said, no, I don't think that's going to work, huh? Dr. Johanna came and said to him, no, here's, I'm a doctor, trust me. Trust me, I'm a doctor. Live this way. Do this. Take this medicine. You'll be okay. He would have looked at Johanna and said, I don't think so. Have you seen me? If Don came and said, come on, let's go into the gym. Abraham, let's pump some iron. Flash those basketball arms of his off. Abraham would have looked at Don and said, Don, you know what? I don't think so. Don't believe because I'm telling you. Don't believe because I'm in simply encouraging. Look unto Jesus, the author, author and finisher of our faith. It is He who saved you. It is He who works upon you, who gave you His Spirit. And the Bible says that He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Rejoice in that. Beloved, if you would be strengthened in your faith, if you want to believe more, if you want to have strong faith, you know, many years ago, I was in Ireland, and the best barbers, you know what a barber is? A guy who cuts your hair? In Ireland are Turkish barbers, okay? Turks. They're fantastic. I take my boys there. They get their hair cut when we're in Ireland. Fantastic. Great experience. Put hot towels on your face. They give you a rub and everything. And, and I was talking to this man, the Turkish barber, a Muslim fella, and he was saying, so who are, who are, who are you? Said, and this is my sons. He says, how many sons do you have? I have six sons. He went, six sons, strong man. <laughs> Beloved, it's not about strength in our, in our own ability. It's not about who we are in our flesh. We look unto Jesus because he is the strong man. He accomplished salvation by the work of his own hand. It is not... Our reward is not purchased by you being good, by you reading your Bible dutifully, by you praying continually. No! If that's what you think, then you have missed the entire theme of the conference. It is our confidence in Jesus, in His work, in His goodness, in His righteousness. I do not have access to God because I pray and read and preach. No! Because Jesus died for me. Because He died for me, I have friendship with God. And I've received His Spirit. And because of that, therefore, I can be confident and bold and reckless in my faith. I think William Carey, reckless in his faith. You know, can you imagine Re William Carey's mom? Are you sure it's, it's safe? taking the kids, you know, have you had all your inoculations? Do you have travel insurance? You know the man who changed the world didn't have dentist insurance or travel insurance or car insurance? They just went and changed the world. May have cost them their life, but they died rejoicing. Entering into heaven as heroes. <sighs> Listening to eternity applaud as they take their crowns and cast them at the feet of Jesus. For your sake, Lord, to you be the glory. To you be the glory. Oh, beloved, look unto Jesus. If you're a believer here tonight, be strong in your faith. Know the God of the Bible, not the God of your imagination, not the God represented by the people of the world. It saddens me, you know. Saddens me that more people have a, a relationship with Facebook, more Christians have a, a relationship with Facebook than they have with the Holy Spirit. They have more fellowship with Christians through Facebook.
than the Holy Spirit. Now, Facebook is a tool, just like a phone or whatever else. But we give more time to the distractions of this world than we do to the reading of Scripture, and to the knowing of the Word, to the, the memorization. If we truly believed that this was God speaking, would we not pay more attention to it? Would we not live our lives in such a way as that we would be fearful, fearful to act or, or to speak outside the confines of what God says? That we wouldn't be among those who say, well, I believe it's this or I believe it's that. Thus says the Lord is what we would say. The Lord has said in the Bible, I, I teach my people this, when we answer a question, we say, the Bible says. God says in the Bible. Because God says it. I'm not going to argue with them. And that gives us confidence. That gives us strength. Not because it's me who's saying it, because it is the Lord. Beloved, when you go back to the place wherever you are from, living your normal life with the normal people who will still always be there, and please God, may you have many years to come, I would have you live differently. I would have Christ in your conversation. I would have a spring in your step and a joy in your heart and a hope for the future. When I die and I go to glory, all my beloved ones will be there. That's my hope. My hope is that I won't go there alone. I will, it won't be just Sarah and I and the kids won't be there. Oh God, save our kids. Do we believe in the grace of God? If we did, would we not pray? The Bible says we have not because we ask not. Oh beloved, let us besiege heaven. Let's keep, let him say to the angels, go and quieten those fins down because they're way too loud. Not in a crazy, charismatic way. Not in some chaos, but in a concerted effort. Lord, thy, thy word says, you have promised, we will not let you go until you bless us. Oh God, touch their hearts and save them. Beloved, when you go home, be different. Be different. Be different than the people around you. Be different than the church of our age. It's all about entertainment. Be different. I would have you strengthened in your faith. Go home strong. Again, forgive me. This is but the rambles of a pastor concerned for his people. But beloved, I believe it is the heart of God that you would have strong faith. Not in yourself. Not in me. Not in the doctrines of grace or the 1689 or whatever, whatever, whatever. In Him, in Christ crucified. And beloved, tonight, if you do not know Jesus, kids, if you do not have the faith that I am talking about, if you do not know the joy of sins forgiven and peace with God, and me saying to you, have strong faith is useless because you have none. The, der the duty of all men everywhere is to believe and to repent. Tonight it is not an accident that you are here. You may be here because mom and dad have brought you. You may be here because someone has invited you and by obligation you have come but ultimately you are here because God has brought you here. It is the will of God that you might hear the gospel. It is the love of God being poured out to you. It is the hand of God reaching out to you. It is the will of God that Christ is so clearly portrayed as crucified before your very own eyes. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have not been born again, 
The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. The Bible says, believe. Repent and believe and be baptized. Give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Name Him as your Lord and as your Savior. Tonight, God offers you salvation. He would rescue you from a lost eternity. Do not harden your heart. Do not deafen your ears. Do not turn aside from the truth. Tonight, let me say, God loves you with an everlasting love. How do I know that? How do I know that God loves you with an everlasting love? Jesus died for sinners. For God, for God so loved the world. And if you're alive, you're a part of that world. Tonight, know that God loves you. But you must repent of your sins. And you must confess Him as Lord. Ask Him. Say to Him, Lord, my heart is hard and I do not love You and I do not feel the urgency or the need. I remember when I came to faith 30 years ago. Yes, I am that old. And I remember saying, Lord, I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. I love my sin. I don't want this. And yet I saw that the only way to get into heaven was by the Lord Jesus Christ. And I remember as I traveled from one classroom to another in my high school, and I, I, I said in my heart, oh, Jesus, help me to believe these things. Oh, Jesus, help me to believe these things because I can't by myself. And the truth is, I was gloriously and wonderfully saved. Something changed inside me. It was not natural. He gave me His Spirit and justified me in the eyes of God. Tonight, if you do not know the joy of sins forgiven and the empowering, transforming influence of the Holy Spirit in your life, seek Him. Beloved, I am not going to ask anyone to put up their hand or pray a prayer. What foolishness is that? But I encourage you to take it seriously. I encourage you to, to think of eternity. Life is but an instant. I have been a believer for 30 years. Again, I know it doesn't, it's hard to believe. You're like, Kyle, you must have been four when you came to faith. No. And that time has gone in a blink. Sarah and I have been married 22 years. It feels like a week sometimes. Life passes so swiftly. There's not a moment to lose. This may be the only opportunity you ever get to hear the gospel. It may be the only opportunity anyone ever gives you. You might leave this place and die. You might leave this place and later tonight the Lord might return. And the game is over. Beloved, kids, friends, I encourage you to take your salvation seriously. Do not let this day pass. It may be your only opportunity. Christ extends you welcome. He bids you come. Come to the Savior. Beloved, when you go home, I would have you having strong faith. Whether that be new faith or simply a renewed old faith, Go home and trust in the Savior. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Lord. Lord, tonight, we are so aware of the shortness of life. Lord, I'm so aware that I may never see any of these people ever again. This may be the one and only opportunity I get to share with them or speak to them. I pray, Lord God, that Your words might sink into their hearts. That, Lord, they won't go home. They won't leave this building. They won't travel from here and just be the same. 
Lord, we desire changed hearts. We desire transformed lives. We desire men and women of courage. Lord God, we think of our kids. We think of those who do not know you this evening. Lord, I pray, impress upon their hearts the need for salvation. Let them see of your great love, Lord, of, of, of your welcoming arms. Let them know, Lord. Lord, we cry to you, the gracious Savior. Lord, graciously save them. Oh, God, grant them understanding. Speak so clearer than we. Lord, one of the little ones came up to me this morning and, and said, Pastor Kyle, Pastor Kyle, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Lord, if a little child can know the Bible that well, oh, God, you can save them. Lord, please, we pray for the children. and We pray for those who do not know you here. Lord God, that you might grant them faith, that they might repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for them and purchased their salvation. For we, Lord, who already believe, we ask that you would grant us a greater measure of faith. That, Lord God, we don't look for a, a charismatic gifting. We don't look for a, a boldness that is imparted to us. Lord, we pray for a greater resolve, a greater faith in your word, that your word, as we study it, as we mine it, as we refine it in our hearts and store it in our innermost beings, Lord, it will guard our minds. It will armor our hearts. That, Lord, no matter what the world, the flesh, and the devil may throw at us, we would stand victorious, dressed in your armor. Oh, God, that we might be victorious in this life, that, Lord God, we might look upon the world and say, you're not big enough because my Savior is the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Oh, Lord, please impress upon our hearts. Please, Lord. These are, have been foolish and feeble words. But, oh God, you are a mighty Savior. You are a mighty God. Lord, the things that I have not been able to say and the things I could not say impress upon their hearts. Lift up their eyes and let them see Jesus, we pray. Lord, I pray this for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.